Oh man, what's going on? Where's all our stuff? Oh, are we live, dude? Like, why are we so late today? Sorry, guys. We just got like we got we got a new eCam. We got the Stream Deck XL, so now we can switch out of our channel on a live stream. But it causes a little start of a glitch. Wait, are we live now? We're, we're live, man. We're live. Shoot, we're man. sorry, guys. You didn't tell me. You didn't tell me. We're live, <laughs> dude. We're live. <laughs> hey, guys. Welcome, everybody. This is Pixel Sabers. Um, we're coming to you live today. Sorry we're late. We're supposed to start like three minutes ago, but we got this new Stream Deck XL so that we can make our live stream more interactive, more fun, but it caused us problems to start today. My bad, sorry for that. But today, in this live stream, we're gonna talk about what cameras I use to shoot weddings. Uh, my name is David. Right here is Jeremy Chan. Jeremy also shoots wedding, by the way. He's been shooting weddings for like 15 mm -hmm. years. He uses a very different system than I do. He uses the Fuji system. And let me tell you a little secret. It's a crop sensor system. But, 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 okay, he takes amazing, what, what, what? It's crop sensor, not crap sensor, okay? I That's said a huge crop. Difference. I respect you, my no, friend. I, I said you. crop. <laughs> crop, A-P-S-C, crop. All right, so all right, he, all right, fine. he uses a smaller moving sensor. On. But but moving on, it's not a bad thing, but on a side note, he uses the Fuji film system. If you want to see all his gear, check out our previous video we did about um, a couple weeks ago. It's on Amazon Live as well as on YouTube, and we talk about all his gears and what gears he uses, like the Fuji X-T3, great, great equipment. But me, I use the Canon series. Uh, I use Canon 1DX. Let me pick it up right now. So I use the Canon 1DX, and basically in this video, I'm gonna show you all the gear that I use to shoot wedding. I've been shooting for 10 years. These are the equipment that I have and I, I use personally. Some of this stuff is a little bit outdated because as you shoot wedding for 10 years, you, you accumulate your gear over time. You don't buy all that at once and you don't renew it every time something brand new comes out too. Um, so if you're buying something brand new right now, definitely I would recommend going with a mirrorless system. Uh, something, if you're on the Canon line, check out the EOS R5 that's coming out really soon. But if you're like a, a Fujifilm line. Yeah, I heard line, that's a good one. I heard yeah. that's a good one. Yeah, and this guy, um, he's a Fuji fan, so he'll probably recommend the X-T4, which is an amazing camera. And right now, the X-T3, which is also a very capable camera, is um, discounted greatly because the X-T4 is out. I, I have a hidden history that nobody knows about. What's that? I'm, I used to be a Sony Artisan ambassador, Why so... Why are you saying years. that now? <laughs> <laughs> so, he uses a lot of cameras, so he's going to judge me on what I use. Now, one thing about so, me... Wait, yes. wait, what, what was that new um, Canon mirrorless camera call? R5. The the oh, Canon R5. So, R5. Yeah. So, this is Lil Bird told me, actually, rumors that mm -hmm. a lot of Sony, a lot of people were from Canon and moved mm -hmm. to Sony. Mm -hmm. And then now, because there's UF R5 coming out, a lot mm -hmm. of people was moving away from Sony, go back to Canon again, <laughs> just because of the camera. The Canon R5 is fantastic. It's, it's a really good system. Basically, Canon R5 has all the features that Canon has always crippled in all their cameras. And it's the one thing that Canon does, I don't know why they do it, but they make their cameras a little bit more expensive and just lacks a little bit of features to compete with the bigger guys. Like why? Why Why do you do that Canon? But Canon still gets a sale. That's the crazy thing. They, they don't have everything and you want more but people still buy their gear. So maybe that's why they do it. But the R5 changes everything because that's the first camera that Canon would all out put the whole kitchen sink in there, all the features you want, dual memory card, like crazy uh, filming rates. Everything, 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 like in-body image stabilization, everything. It's, it's a crazy camera. Check it out. It's not available right now, but it'll be out soon. So, And also, they used the, the whole new R-series R glass now, R-line R of lens, very fantastic stuff. But um, nonetheless, this video is a little bit more about, about what camera I use. So this is the Canon 1DX Mark II. This is what I use, and it... Uh, it's a sports camera. It's a camera that people use to shoot Olympics and uh, safari and wildlife with. So it's a beast of a camera. I simply wanted the best camera money could buy because, you know, wedding photography is my bread and butter. Mm -hmm. 
I make money with it and I want my clients to have the absolute best photo and I also want the perception of having really high-end gear, right? So that's one thing that sometimes you don't need the best gear to shoot a wedding but it's nice to have because it, it, it has a built-in perception because nowadays a lot of brides and grooms, they know about camera. So if you tell them you shoot with the, one, uh, with the 5D Mark IV, they're like, I have a 5D Mark IV, right? So they think, well, okay, mm. so is that, is, why, why do you use the same gear I use, right? But technically, it's not, it's not the gear that makes a photographer, it's how you use it, right, Jeremy? Absolutely. <laughs> That's why I use a crap yeah. sensor. <laughs> Yes, yeah, whatever, what, crop sensor, and you shoot amazing photos with that too. And very, you get a lot of heat when you take your uh, X-T4 or X-T3 or even when you had your D600 to a wedding, right? No, not anymore. I mean, people actually really um, respect Fujifilm, to be honest. I mean, ah. they know they're uh, beautiful photography. Yes, yeah. I mean, all yeah. the oldies, like the older generation, we respect Fuji like even more <laughs> than Nikon and Sony, honestly. So no, no hits there. No. It's just back then when I used that Sony crop lens that they do because they don't never believe Sony actually make cameras. <laughs> you know, yep. when it, you you talk about Sony, oh PlayStation, yeah, yeah you don't talk right. about <laughs> right or TVs, so, right or VCRs, yeah. But Sony's mm -hmm. make um, now that now they're popular for cameras, but in the beginning they weren't as popular. And maybe it's because oh. of you that made cam the I made really the Sony it. line the way it is now, right? <laughs> You made it good, you made it popular, you made it something big in the wedding industry. So speaking of big, the Canon oh. 1DX camera is huge. And sometimes if you couple that with uh, the 70 to 200 f2.8 right? IS, this, this is a beast. But make no mistake, this takes amazing, amazing photos. Whether you're in low light situations or you're very far away, some of the best cam pictures come from this setup here, the 7200 with my 1DX Mark II. Um, it's fantastic combination here. So, hey, it didn't is, they make like a smaller version of that zoom lens? Is it camera? Do. Yeah, they do. So let me let me actually pull up the 7200 so people know which one I'm talking about. And we can actually see it on Amazon right now. So Canon makes a couple of 7200. They make um, a 2.8. IS, they make a 2.8 without IS, and they make an F4 and also F4 without IS, I believe. So here's, here's an example of um, the 2.8 without IS. And I mm. actually do not recommend this one, well, for wedding, okay? It's, it's a good lens, it's a little bit light weight, lighter weight than the, the one with IS, but when you're shooting wedding, you're typically in a lower light situation, especially in a church or a reception hall where you have low light. You really want to have that IS to help you because the longer your focal length is, the more steady you have to hold the camera lens if you're shooting at a slow shutter. Usually the rule That's true. Yeah, usually generally the rule is your shutter speed should be no slower than one over the focal length, roughly, right? So if you're shooting at 200 millimeter, your shutter speed should be one over 200th, which is actually pretty fast. And I can stretch that to like one over 80 if I have IS. Uh, whereas if I don't have oh, IS- Oh, you, you need an IS for that type of lens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. So that's why I don't recommend this um, 7200 without IS. So the newest one they have is a 7200 f2.8 IS Mark III, and that thing is awesome. People love hey, this. They lens. have a f4 lens for this, right? They so do. To f4. Yes. Yeah. So that, that one has IS or not? Uh, there's two. They have one with IS and one without. So this is the one without IS, and it's super cheap. I think this is it's great super if you. Yeah, it's lightweight and it's great for like if you are on like going out to safari. Five yeah, shooting some somewhere outside. Right, where you don't need the IS. So it's, it's a nice, cam, nice lens um, and it's pretty cheap. 7200 on a full frame is amazing. Um, 7200, if you put it on a crop sensor, it's 1.6 1 times, 1 .6 times 200, so you get a super long focal length. And don't forget with Canon, you have the tele extender. So if you ever want to put like, um, I think they have like a Canon tele extender. They have like a 1.3 and a 2. Point, uh, that, yeah, they have a 1.4. Let me, let me, let me, 1.4. Yeah. 
Nutella extender. They have it for yeah. They have a two. There you go. That one. Yeah, they have a two X and a one point four. Uh, I never recommend a two X unless you really have a lot of light because it takes you down. I think two stops of light, whereas a one point four takes you down one stop of light. I can't remember exactly because I don't use these extenders. How is the so, image quality with that? It's really good. The only try. thing that suffers a little bit is the focal uh, focusing speed. It's a tad slower when you have the yeah. extender on, but um, technically the the, foc the the quality is pretty darn good because especially if you're buying the Canon version, you're you're paying a lot for quality glass between these. So extenders. if you are putting a one point four on to your seventy two hundred, what would that become like? That would be. <laughs> Yeah, if you just pop pop in a calculator, so the set the the, the wider I'm, one I'm would be like ninety eight <laughs> millimeter, right? So ninety eight to um, what? One point four no. times. <laughs> yeah, ninety eight. So one hundred millimeter to to two eighty, right? It's a so it's a, basically you know how yeah. they they have like a three hundred millimeter, right? Yeah. So uh -huh. you buy a seventy two hundred and plus this is actually much more affordable yeah. and has the closest um focal range then, right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. But we're Ooh. going back to what I use for wedding. So I don't use any of these. I just use a 70 to 200, 2.8 IS. I have the version two, which I think is fantastic. The version three, I think it has a little improvement. Always the newer one has better optics slightly, usually has better focusing, uh, maybe has a, a shorter minimum focus distance. I don't know. But in general, I love the, um, the original version. I had the original, 70 to 200 f 2.8 is mark one when i started my photography business like 10 years ago and it was fantastic i only upgraded to the mark ii just because i can write it off as a tax write-off i didn't really need it but i realized that the minimum focus six minimum focus distance required for this lens is a little bit better than the previous version which i like because sometimes you're using this indoor to shoot um a groom or bride portrait at 70 millimeter. Um, mm -hmm. that, that extra distance that you can use to focus with the minimum distance actually helps because I can actually use this indoor without having to swap out the lens. So it helps, it helps. Um, but again, you don't need to buy the Mark III. You can be happy with the Mark II or if you're on a budget, you can get the Mark I. Um, one thing to know about wedding gear is that you should always have a backup. I usually shoot oh. with two cameras in me. Right? What do you use? Do you have backups too, Jeremy? How does how does backup work of for course. you? Of uh, course, two camera obviously, and then yeah. one extra camera. Probably not the high, highest one. Let's just keep it there, just in case. If so unlucky that both of my camera were fail on me, that yes. at least I got something to shoot with. Yes, so. that's so important. Yeah, I always have mm -hmm. a backup in the car. So this is my 1DX Mark II, but I also have several 1DX Mark I that I still have with me. So what, my, my main camera is 1DX Mark II. I carry two cameras on me at once. The, the second one is a 1DX Mark I, so I have this other one. So this is, this is, this is my, my, my Truo right here, right? So I got my 70 That's to 200. That's a one I just carry. <laughs> it is, and this is my 1DX with my 85. So. The 7200 is the most used lens I have. Uh, the other, I should actually step back and say, as a wedding photographer, the two lens that you need the most is the 70, uh, 24 to 70, which is this one. And then you need the 70 to 200, which is the one that we just saw earlier, this guy. So these are the two lens mm. that you definitely would need to have. Um, especially starting wedding photography because these two lens gives you the full coverage, 24 to 70, and this one picks up from 70 to 200, right? So the you basically can cover everything like it, a full focal ring with those two lens. Yes, exactly it. And both of these are f 2.8, and that's very important for a wedding photographer because you want to have the the wider aperture specifically for the low light situation. Because in wedding photography, you are always dealing with very difficult lighting situation. You want the f 2.8. Uh, now we could talk about prime too. I love primes, and primes can have. See, that's what I'm just trying to get into. Yes. Because if, when you start with um, wedding photography, the, yes. the ultimate thing is you want to capture and cover the full event of wedding, right? Yes. So with the 2470 to 7200, you're pretty much able got, to yeah. cover everything. Exactly. In per, personal experience, yes. After a couple of years in that. I feel kind of boring just keep shooting it with the 2470 and and yes. there where prime comes in. 
Yes. That allows you to be more creative and more artistic. Yes. What's and your you're more comfortable price? moving around. Yes. I would have to say, depends on the location. If it's indoor, I would say 35. Yes. And if it's outdoor, it will be 85. Yes, those are exactly my two as well. So with, with Canon's line, uh, the 85 is interesting. Let me pull up the 85 for you. So the 85, uh, Canon has several 85s. Let me pull this. Ah, so many lenses. Do you ever it's, ask this camera manufacturer, lens manufacturer, why the heck do they make so many lenses? Because they want you to to buy more <laughs> lenses. Like how many versions of one focal length do you really need? <sighs> well, they come out in different time periods too. Like um, over time, they have new lenses. And so this is the 85 F1.2 Mark II. This lens came out a long time ago. Let me actually pull this up. Actually, let's do a quick Wikipedia. Let's do Canon. Wikipedia. 85 millimeter, yeah, f1.2. When did this lens get released? Because I'm curious um, when it came out. Is there like a Wikipedia on here? Oh, like, I guess, yeah, like 2006, this was reviewed on the digitalpicture.com. So this lens That's long time ago. is old. And one of the disadvantages is that it's so slow, partially because the lens element on this lens it's huge. Look at this lens element, man. It is like I know. huge. So that means there's a lot of glass here. Every time you're trying to focus, it's pushing through a lot of glass. And that's why this lens takes a long time to focus and it's slow to focus. And the, seven, uh, the 85 millimeter F1.2 Mark I, which is the one that came out before this. Oh man, when did that came out? Uh, let's see, the original one, that one is really slow. I don't even think it's called Mark 1. It's like just F, yeah, wh when, when, when did this come out? I'm curious now. Hey, I this, forgot what USM stands for again. USM stands for ultrasonic motor. Oh, that's right. It's yes. more silent, right? Yeah. Yes, it's more silent. But the funny thing is, it's not the most recent technology now. Uh, STM is the newer technology now. Uh, it's a stepper motor and mm. it's quieter. It's actually better for video too because it's faster and it's quieter and it's really good for video. Uh, USM isn't as good for video, but they're great for photography still because they're quick and fast and they work well with these professional lenses, which are heavy and have a lot of glass. So that's why the USM motors are used for these guys. Uh, I think the STM motors are more suited for a lighter weight lens. Don't quote me on that, but I've only seen the STM motors on the smaller, cheaper lens, like on uh, my um, APS-C, um, line of cameras, which is the EFM mounts. So going back to your, your favorite, uh, Jeremy, is the 85 millimeter. Also one of my favorite too, these things take amazing prime pictures. What, what's so, so great about the 85 for you? It's smooth, super smooth. <laughs> yeah. um, sometimes you just want to isolate all the I want to say best like crowd of people or mm -hmm. miscellaneous stuff on the side and just focus on the couples. Yeah. 85 is per. I mean, if the background is not that great, you're the <laughs> <hell> out of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, whether it's great or not, it gives you like really good isolation. That, and it, it allows you to, f without thinking of composition, right? It's a lazy way to get free composition is that you blow out the background. And with a shallow depth of field and 85 and a busy wedding day, you can't find, you want to capture really quick and you're at the moment, like you're shooting a bunch of guest candidates, right? You don't have too much time to frame the shot. You're like, boom, guest, boom, guest, boom, guest. You move around table to table and shoot random portraits of guests. And I love the 85 mm -hmm. for that because it just blows out the background. Whether it's a nice background or a background with a bunch of other people, it just blows it out. So you can focus on the people. It forces the viewer to look at what you focus on. So 85 mm -hmm. is really good for weddings. Um, it's not my my first choice if I only have one lens to pick. Like if I only have it's one actually lens. It's perfect for outdoor portraiture. It is. Yeah, on a full frame, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's at the cusp of distance where you just have enough distance where you can still communicate with your subject. 
Any longer than that, you'll be yelling. Well, I tend you we hear my noise right now. I tend to have a soft noise, so eighty five is not my perfect lens. Yes. Uh, because I can't really communicate with my clients <laughs> if they're too far yeah. away. They can't hear me. Yes. I have to call them. <laughs> yeah. Hey, pick up your phone. Here. I need to tell you <laughs> how to pose. <laughs> right. Or just like look at each other or face each other or put your hand around her. Right. You got to guide in different directions. I never do those like 200 or 100 millimeters portrait because they are too darn far away. I can't talk to them. Well, you got to condition them. So what we tell them is like you got to face each other. You got to look at each other. Look at each other, right? Uh, I haven't, dude, I've been like in shelter in place so long, I forgot my little systems that I used to tell them. Like, look at each other, uh, kiss each other, right? Or hug each other, or hold up and spin. You, you kind of give them like these tips first. And then once they're at 200 millimeters away, you can kind of like guide them and uh, hold, right? Yeah, yeah. you still fine tune them, like what, yeah. if other pose. Yeah. Because they don't know what, what's a good angle towards the lens. You have yes. to tell them that. Yeah. So another lens that I like a lot is actually a 16 to 35 millimeter uh, 2.8. This one, it's a little bit redundant if you have the 70 to 200 as well because it covers a lot of the normal focal length too. The 70 to 2, sorry, did I say 70 to 200? I meant 24 to 70. So <laughs> we, earlier we said that this is the staple lens. The 24 mm -hmm. to 70 and the 70 to 200 is your staple lens, right? But once you start mm -hmm. uh, peering out, if you want to stick with zoom, the other zoom lens that I would recommend is this 16 to 35 millimeter. I did believe they oh, have yeah, a, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah, this is a good one. What do you like about the 16 to 35 or equivalent, Jeremy? Well, with the 16, if you're indoor, uh, you could actually create some kind of dramatic look by applying the wide angle effect. Yes. So that would make the picture more interesting. Yes, yeah. I, I love it. And also one of the cool thing is, and I think you mentioned this before in our previous videos, Jeremy, usually the 1635 has a very unusual short minimum focus distance. In fact, I can focus closer with the 1635 than I could with the 24 to 7, uh, 24 to 7. Oh, yeah. It's got the really wide angle, so you have a very unique perspective to shoot wedding. Like if you want to make the dress look very grand and wide, you can get down low and shoot with this lens. Or if you want to capture something just <laughs> wide, like the whole church or the whole reception area, this lens does it for you. So again, you start with the 24 to 70, then you got the 70 to 200. This is perfect for starting out. If you want to add another zoom, at the 16 to 35, and that's a you good, ever good use a 16 35 for portrait, like zoom all the way to 35 and do portrait? I have, yeah, when I need to. I try not to because um, if I do portraits, I usually shoot with my 85, and if I can't get my 85 on, I'll throw my 70 to 200 and shoot portrait with that because I like yeah, the, the compressed back. 85, you can only do like single person or a couple mm -hmm. really close up portrait. Mm -hmm. With the 35, you could do environmental portrait, which let's say the church in the back, mm -hmm. and you could put them together and capture the church all together. 85 yes. can't do that unless you walk, you walk really far backward. Yes, I keep on forgetting environmental portrait. Yes, for environmental portrait, you can definitely shoot with the 1635. And I, I find the portraits I shoot with the 1635 sharper than the 24 to 70. I don't know I don't know why the 24 to 70 is just like an okay lens. It does everything really good, but it doesn't do any it doesn't do anything great. When I want something really good, I usually stick the 1635 on for some sharp wide shots. And if yeah, I want uh, something my, more, my friend is a Canon shooter. I think his yeah. favorite combination is the 16 to 35 and then the 51.2 and he only used the 7200 for ceremonies and stuff, mm -hmm. and then other than that would be the 85 1.2. Yeah. That, that's the four lens we'll carry, but that's a good he don't use the 2470. <laughs> yeah, the 2470, uh, yeah, it's nice to start out with. When you are very in beginning and getting to wedding, it's a good one to have because you feel safe with this lens. If you have only one camera and one lens, you can do the whole wedding with this one lens. You feel very mm -hmm. safe. But as you start to get more comfortable and, and find out what your style is, you might want to use a zoom and a prime or maybe this zoom and a prime. Uh, sometimes if I'm shooting something that's, uh, um, 
not not too constrained and I can move around quite a bit, I'll go pretty extreme. I'll use the 85 and the 7200. One camera with the 85 and one camera with the 7200. And that's that's kind of a little bit on the extreme side because then I don't get a chance to shoot any wide shots. Um, but I do that when I have an environment where I can walk around a lot and I can move quite a bit. But if I don't, what I like to do is I usually like to stick on the 35. Let me point you guys to the 35 millimeter lens here. So the 35 f1.4 is also a really nice lens too. Uh, once you start with prime, the nice thing about the prime is you have that super wide aperture. So you get more light in and you get more shallow depth of field. Um, mm -hmm. You start having to realize that you can't zoom anymore because this is 35, right? Uh, but it gets you more creative. You move around more and you have to position yourself in different locations to get the right shots. Um, but the, the, the low light capability is just amazing. Once you start shooting with it, you realize, wow. Oh, and also it's more sharp. It's much more sharper than if I shot with the 16-35 at 35 millimeter versus oh, yeah, totally. this you one know what? at 35. I, yeah. For some reason, all the prime lenses is always sharper than the zoom lens. Of always. course. I mean, by optics, right? Because you have one lens that's designed for 35 millimeter. The optics inside only moves only when you focus, but it doesn't move around to change the focus distance. So it's really fine tuned and optimized for that one focal length. Whereas when you have a lens like this, you're designing a lens that just kind of changes different focal length as you move around. So you can't, you can't design something that's perfectly sharp throughout the whole range. You have to make compromises. So that's why zoom lenses aren't as sharp, typically. And also, the, the prime lens kind of give you more creativity because you're limited to one focal length and then yes. you, you have to play the heck out of it. Yeah. While if you have like a 2470, you have to choose between, okay, you just kind of turning around, oh, what focal length should I use? And then you just yeah. kind of minus, you just playing around and then you don't have to focus try to get the image with just that one focal length. Yes, yeah, and it, it, it makes sense. Like, here's a good example. Like, I can be standing in the corner with the 2470, then boom, all right, I got a wide shot, all right, and, that, and with the long shot, and then I can get a wide shot, and eh, maybe I'll shoot up, maybe I can shoot down, maybe I'll shoot here, right? But now, if I'm on a 35 prime, well, here's my shot, here's one shot, and here's one shot, now what? Then you start thinking, oh, let me move around, let me get behind a chair, or let me get around behind this bush of plants, or let me get behind um, like this decorations, or get behind the cake, right? You have different perspective now, it forces you to be creative because you can't just change the zoom to get another focal <laughs> length, right? You, you start to get so limited that you actually have to move around, which is actually a good thing because then your pictures are a lot better than if you stayed in the same place mm -hmm. in zoom anyway. And also it's lighter. Oh yeah, it's lighter, <laughs> yeah. It, so prime lenses are amazing. They're lighter, they're sharper, they let in more light, um, and they allow you to be more creative. This is this is what I recommend. If you just start it, go with the 2470, 7200, so you know you can do your job right. Yes. And when you have your couple years in, either you are experienced enough that you can just pay with the prime lens, yes. or you're actually able to afford to get a second shooter. Let the second shooter have all the 2470 and 7200. Let let that person cover the event, and you just go play. <laughs> yeah, that that's the best because like. You, that you said it so well, Jeremy. I don't know how to elaborate on that anymore, but yep. The only thing is, you, your second shooter better get the shots because those shots that they're shooting with the 70 to 200 and 2470, those are the must have, right? Because when you go play, you're taking the creative uh, and the fun ones. I know this is kind of out of the topic, like how many yeah. must have shot you have in a wedding, right? The preparation, you know, it's you saw play out, it's good. Yes. Uh, the first look must have, yeah. you know, it's yes. planned it, so it, you can't really mm -hmm. miss that. Yeah. The must have shot, I would say, is the kissing shot. Yes. Right? Walking yeah. the aisle, giving a hand from the yes. for father to, you know, yep. uh, the husband. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the exchanging the ring shot. Mm -hmm. And the last kiss, that's pretty much the must have shot. Yeah, well, I think the other must have, I, I think about, are the family formals. Right? Oh, the, because th those are must. <laughs> the, those yeah. are not decisive moments. This, yes. this is, those are actually you know, 
you can, we take if you missed it, right? I'm That's talking true. about the one that you can't miss. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. We're on a different. I was slightly off topic on what you were saying, but you're right. Yeah, there's there's actually that not that many must have, and with those must have, you can still capture it with the prime lens and have fun with it too, because you'll get better shots now. You'll get also, well at least in my perspective, I don't know about you, but I miss more shots when I shoot with the 85 because the focus is so slow and oh, I yeah. usually shoot it's wider just... open. So like I get less less in, less in sharp photos, but the ones I hit, oh man, the, I nail them. Like, like the expression, if the expression is good, the focus is good, this lens is magic. It just makes the picture well, so nice. Let's just say never use the 85 to replace your 7200. Yeah. Exactly. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> no. It's not yeah. for me doing that. It's, it's very hard for a new photographer to realize that. Like you say, okay, well, if you have 85, then let me compromise with the 7200 and just shoot 85. It's not quite the same, right? Because although this one, if you, even if you stick this one at 85 and only be at 85, it's faster, it has IS, and it has more capability than this. Whereas this one is more of a creative tool when you really know what you're doing and you are in, diff in the, the right situation where you can take your time to shoot the picture. Whereas something like this mm -hmm. is better for locking focus much quicker and being robust with the IS and ability to move around. So you're right, it can't replace it, but once you're very good, oh, hey, we got some comments. We got Paul Huynh. Dude, Paul Huynh goes back back in the days. I knew Paul from high school. He's a photographer as well. In fact, Ooh. I yeah, Paul Huynh. He's um he's a good friend of mine. In fact, I, I don't know if I have my 50 millimeter f 1.2 here, but uh, back in the days, I sold um, Paul a 50 millimeter f 1.2 uh, lens. Hey Paul, yeah, we're talking about you. We're talking about photography and lenses in general. I'm talking about all the gears that I use. Like I, I use a lot of gears. I have the 85-1.2, I have the 35 millimeter 1.4, we got a 16-35 here, 24-70 here, a 70-200. I got some other lenses, and we're just talking about lenses you that fish you would eye. need. I do. I have. <laughs> it's somehow I just knew you have a fish, fish eye. eye. I don't know why. <laughs> so this is a 15 millimeter fish eye. You know what my problem is? I have gas, which is short for gear acquisition syndrome. And I don't know how other photographers don't have gas. I think everyone does. I don't. You don't have it, Jeremy. No, not me. I don't have it. <laughs> I, I don't get it. Like, how do you not have gas? Because once you start getting to photography, you like you want to know what other lens can capture, but at the same time you don't want to sell your other lenses, so you want to just acquire them all so that you have all the lenses. And when you go to different events, you can just shoot all of them. It just it's just so exciting. But maybe because that's my engineering side, I like to be very experimental with lenses. So I actually have like pretty much all of Canon's lenses, even like. Um, How often do you shoot with your um, fish eyes anyway? So the fisheye is actually always on me when I go to wedding. I shoot about maybe... Oh, well. Yes. Yeah, I shoot about 3% of my photos with the fisheye. Actually, I should show you like my setup of how I shoot weddings, right? So I have like... I have this. So when I wear this, right, I have like four <laughs> lenses on me and I have a holster on this side for one camera. I have a holster on this side for the other camera. And then I got this long one fits a 70 to 200. This one is either my um, 16 to 35 or my 35 millimeter, whichever I want, I want to choose. This one fits my 85 and this one fits my fisheye. So I always have all these gears. So I have so much variety when I'm shooting. Let me guess. Yeah. After a 16 hour wedding, your back is killing you. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And don't forget. And your legs. Oh, don't forget, I have to carry this monster of a light stand too. So this oh, is man, my- Oh man, dude, you need to upgrade your lighting. Man. <laughs> no one do that anymore. Well, this is what I use. Like nowadays we got LEDs, we got like Stella Pro lights, we got more compact flashes that are more powerful. But back in the days, this set up with four flashes. But you know what? Is this is you know what's good about good. that setup? Yeah. Uh, you don't really need an umbrella or a softbox on that because the light source itself is big enough. Well, because it it needs to be dispersed though. That's the problem. Because with no, this but if you do an outdoor really high wind, then you don't want that. that that's yeah. 
Yeah, if you're outdoor, it's okay. And you want, really want to overpower the sun, then yes. that's okay too. Yeah, but there's one disadvantage of this is that, you know, sometimes you have harsh shadow. Well, now you have four harsh shadows. So you got to yes. be careful about that when you have multiple light sources. So, yeah. So, Paul, just talk about camera gear. Paul, do you shoot weddings? Do you shoot events? Do you still shoot? Or you, you're, uh, what, what, what do you do these days if you're still here? Love to hear from you, man. Yeah, and Paul, Paul says uh, he's you know me since elementary school. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Oh, that's way back. It's way back. Let's see. Um, I didn't mention this lens. This lens is, can you guess which lens this is? You're covering up. Uh, is it a macro? Uh, 135. Okay, that's a good yes. one. That's a good focal lens. I love that. That's sweet. Yes, let, let's let's zoom into the 130. Oh, no. Where's my creative? Uh, hang on one second. I wanted to show this on our stream here. 135. Where is it? Huh. You check it. I didn't. I don't know if I added it to our shopping cart here, so people can check out the lens. Hey, Paul said 100 millimeter macro is his favorite. Oh, which is also mine. I that that lens is amazingly, but except it focused, it hunted, right? It hunts. Yeah, but you have two choices at least for the Canon line. So this is my 100 macro. You can you can uh, change it to full focal uh, range or full focus distance range, right? Or you can change it like a 0.5 meter to infinity or 0.3 to 0.5 meter, right? So based on which, which um, limitations you have on the focus range, you might have better performance. You know, I never buy those expensive macro lens. <laughs> like back then with the Sony days, yeah. I basically use uh, a 30 millimeter, which is really cheap uh, macro lens. Ah. Uh, but does it does it let you um, get close in? It gets really close. It's just that with the hundred millimeters, that your depth of field is crazy. When you mm. get that close, yes, you, ha you can put some kind of Christmas lighting behind, and then it becomes the book, and it's just so nice. It but is. I just not willing to pay for that money because it's only for wing shot. How many wing shots do you need for per wedding? I only use it for ring shot. So I'm curious, Paul, why is a 100 millimeter macro your favorite lens? And what do you use it for? Do you use it for video or how, how do you use your 100 millimeter? Oh, he says he likes it for the creamy bouquet. Yeah. yeah. But for, funny thing is a lot of, it's a great portrait lens too, he says. And I agree, it's a very good portrait lens, but I don't know about you, Paul, but I think this one usually comes out too sharp. And yes. you see too much details <laughs> in the portraits. So, yeah, and it's light, lighter than 85. He's actually got a lot got a lot of valid points, Paul. So, it's but, lighter but than he, 85. Uh, I it's think the, the 100 okay. millimeter can do... You, have you seen those uh, portraits that you, could, you, you focus on someone really close? Yes. And that only partial eye is in focus and then you start slowly the depth of field is kind of fading from yes. there yeah with the 100 millimeter i think you can do that but the 85 not so much because you have to get really close to focus to get that kind of um depth yes. of field on, on the person's face yes that's another very good point it's a great portrait lens and you can get very close to your subject with this because hey it's a macro lens that's what it's for so you can get close but yeah i don't use this enough um, and maybe that's my problem with having gas and having all these lenses that if you, you remember my belt, I have all these lenses. I usually don't carry this one around. So the way that I shoot rings at a wedding is I don't shoot it while the bride is getting ready, which I think a lot of photographers do. <laughs> I shoot it during the reception when everybody's eating. I ask them for- No, 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 me too. You yeah, do I too? do the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And while, that, while they're like eating, then I yeah. can have more time to play with setup with the ring which is, you know, doesn't yeah. matter. And that's when I go out to my car and I get this lens, I shoot it and I put this back in the car. That's the only time I use this lens. But if I ever forget this lens, and I think I forgot on one wedding, I freaked out because like, I always use this for, for rings and yeah. But you can also shoot rings with like the, the 24 to 70, the 1635 or the 24 millimeter uh, prime I have so it works it works but I, I always have this as my go-to for rings so Paul mentioned uh, have you guys ever shot with the 50 f 1.0 um, I have not Jeremy have you 
Wait, did Canon make one? Canon made one, uh, but it's old. They have they haven't refreshed that for a very long time, and that lens I costs don't like know. three I with thousand some kind dollars. Of... That no, I, I only play with one, which is a, not even 1.0, it's 1.95. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but those probably don't have autofocus. So the F, no, it's on manual focus. Yeah, so the Canon 50mm F1.0, the funny thing is, it looks almost exactly identical to the 85 1.2, but it's a 50mm F1.0. So, so Paul, do you actually have the 50mm 1.0? That's a crazy lens if you have it. I, it's so, it's so unique. Be Is it worth it? 1.2, 1.0? He had it! Holy cow! You actually bought it! Wow. I guess he had gas too. You guys need to buy yeah. some Tums. Paul, you, <laughs> Paul, you and me, we got crazy gas. <laughs> he says no. <laughs> it's not worth it. Yeah, I agree. It's not worth it. But for the time you, yeah, it's very terrible. It's slow focus, right? It's probably yeah. worse than the 85 1.2. Super, super slow focus. But what do you use it for, uh, Paul? How did you use um, the 50 millimeter 1.0? One, 1. Uh, he still has a 14 millimeter rectilinear still in a box. <laughs> 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 what, what? Wow. <laughs> no, no one would want to shoot with 1.0. Yeah. Like, like he but said, it's too it shallow. Is, yeah, it is, it is a unicorn. And that's why it costs like $3,500 to use. But I think it's really cool to have it, especially if you have gas, gear acquisition syndrome. It's something to have. It's something to be proud about. Bragging rights, exactly. That's why I would, I, that's the one lens that I didn't buy that I could have bought, but I'm like, nah, it's really not worth it. Yeah. So wait, that's... so all your lenses can all that built? You don't have any third parties? Yes, I only buy Canon built ones. I never trust third party because when I started shooting weddings like 10 years ago, third parties once never had the as good build quality and as good focus uh, quality as the Canon ones. Oh no, Sigma did a lot of good lenses. Not when I started. So 10 years ago when I started, I, don't, I didn't remember seeing a lot of Sigma alternatives. And I just kind of got in the habit of saying, okay, well, if I'm buying it for professional work and I need it to work 100% of the time, if the Sigma is cheaper but only works like 98% of the time, then I'd rather buy Canon. Uh, but now that's changed because a lot of Sigma lenses, a lot of uh, Tamron lenses are really great too. So those are options too. Uh, the list that I have included are all the, um, the lenses that I use, like the, the 135, the 2470, the 35 1.4, the 100 macro, the 1635, the 70 to 200, uh, the 85 1.4. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about the 85 1.4, but I actually have the 85 1.2. So these are all the mm -hmm. lenses that I use and they work great mm -hmm. on all the full frame cameras. Right now, I use the 1DX Mark II. If you want, you can get the 1DX Mark III, which is a crazy camera, super overkill for wedding. Uh, for wedding, um, you probably want to be, you're probably good with like a 5D Mark IV, or if you can wait, get the Canon R5 for wedding because that is the first mirrorless camera that Canon has that has dual memory card that I think is good enough to shoot wedding. I know they have the EOS R, which is great. A lot of people use it for wedding, but I will never shoot a wedding on a camera that has only one memory card. I don't care what people say. That's the one thing that I will not do because memory cards, they don't go bad, but when they do, you only need one time to have a heart attack and go crazy because you're paid like five, six, eight, ten thousand dollars for a wedding and if you can't deliver like a half day's worth of photos you are screwed my friend Your reputation is on the line you have pictures to deliver and that's the one thing you gotta have so well it's... lucky for me that never happened to me before but <laughs> i have something else happen my second shooter actually format one of my card no I, but so, but, but like, did you tell that shirt when they format stop don't use anything because if you format well, I think and you don't she, do anything she, she kind of shot a couple of shots and oh. then realized where did you and then i was like where did you get a card from from that bag oh that is a safety bag that's not 
that's not for you to take. Uh, oh. <laughs> so I have to stop and then I have to call. I have like what I what I have is an SD card. So I have to call the company and to get the rescue uh, software. Rescue Pro. Yeah. I get I think eighty percent of those shot back. Yeah. But so that's good enough. But you you don't you can't get hundred percent back. That that sucks. Yeah, because you, what what you do at that point is you are scavenging the file allocation table and getting whichever pictures you, you can get from it. Yeah. I had to do that when I took a wedding, an Indian wedding, nonetheless. That was like twelve hours, and it was a hundred twenty eight gigabyte card. So it lasted the whole day. And you know, you guys that are starting with photography now. It's, it's better because you guys are using SD cards that's cheap, but back in the days, buying a card like this, a 256 gigabyte compact fetch card, used to be on the order of $1,000 for a card. Do you remember that, Jeremy? <laughs> I, I, I paid, I paid $1,000 for, actually, I paid $1,000 for the 128 gigabyte card. I never bought this uh, 256 one at that price. This one, I bought it later when it was like, but your Couple CF card bucks. is much more um, safe because you put it in a jean pocket and then it's safe. But if you yeah. put an SD card with plastic in a jean pocket, if you know you hit it hard, whatever, you can you can break the card. Yeah, but the cool thing about SD card, did you know they're waterproof? Yeah, it's pretty crazy, <laughs> right? I, I it's like what? Take it off my pen. It's in a washing machine and still works. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, it's crazy. I did put I did put a point and shoot like my G7 X Mark II into the washing machine and like the whole camera died. But like the memory card works. Like what? Wait, what, this doesn't make sense. Like so what's going on here? And I looked up online, and it's like, yeah, SD cards are waterproof. Like, wow. That's pretty crazy. Yep. Yeah, Paul knows about it too. <laughs> waterproof. You know, a couple of years ago they always have something um like a new meter where we place SD card. I haven't seen yeah. that happen yet. Um, they have they have XSC now uh, for some of the faster cameras. Uh, I think the um, uh, yeah, R5 but it's not widely used. SD card is still yeah. you know for most of camera. Yeah, and still what good. I like about SD card is that it's fast enough for most stuff like 4K 60 frames per second should be good if you get the high end SD cards. There, there's a debate. Um, yeah, when SD card just came out, being popular, there's a debate yes. between CF card and SD card. Yeah. The older generation is like. I need to use CFD card, CF card because it's much more doable. Yeah. But then, you know, that's an argument, right? But yeah. like, hey, I can always put it in a Pelican SD card case. It's yes. very doable if I put it in there. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah exactly. Um, the one thing that back in the days, I think CF cards were a little bit more reliable just because they were built to a little bit higher standards and more pros use them. So they had a like more pro line for the CF cards, right? Whereas mm -hmm. with the SD card, it wasn't as uh, geared towards pro line. But nowadays, like SD cards are very good. There's a lot of good brands and stuff for it. Do you remember no, the CF card is too big too? Because nowadays, yeah. what I recommend is if once you if you're a wedding photographer, once you're done with oh. the wedding, okay, take yeah. all your card with you, put it with you in your pocket, not in your camera, not in your yeah. camera bag, yeah. because it happened so many times that uh. Either your gear got stolen or robbed, then yep. you know at least you could get your client's picture back. Yes, with you. Yeah, it, they're not gonna take your SD card. Yes, but they don't want you your put SD in card. camera back. They don't want your SD card, but if you put it in camera back, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, Paul mentioned a very good point too. Is that CF cards back in the days was much faster than SD cards. A hundred percent guarantee. Yeah, yeah. Like SD cards used to be slow. Like that's why professionals use uh, CF cards. Uh, CF cards were like usually like I kid you not, like ten times more expensive than SD cards. Like the slow SD cards. It can, really yeah. depends on your shooting style too. If you yeah. just keep shooting but blasting, then it's gonna be slow no matter what. Yeah, well, but if you I, take it one at a time, then it's okay. <laughs> well, it, it's okay to some some people, but like when I use a chip a lot, like if I use my one D Mark III, which is a camera I had back in the day, I one D S Mark III, I would take a picture and I would hit. I have to wait a literally a second and a half, one one thousand and a half, and then see my picture right on a slow card, and that would take. That, that would frustrate me because I want to take a setting and I have flash, I want to make sure my flash fire and I want to have my settings dialed in and I'm waiting for the, the camera to preview. So I needed a fast card. That was important for me. Yeah. That's true. Yep. Paul mentioned, 
I used to have one of those Epson uh, reader monitor that would back up to an internal hard drive. Oh, do you remember those, Jeremy? Epson reader. I'm thinking which one. <laughs> yeah. So back in the days, like when people when people um, had a lot of memory cards and they're at events, especially for videographers, right? Instead of like um, storing it somewhere, they they, ha they after they shoot, they'll put it into this reader and that stores it into an internal hard drive. So it's yeah, all, I have one of those. Yeah. So it's, it's backed up slow. on site. <laughs> well, it's it's nice slow. to have. Yeah, I never use it because I don't think you notice, but like in my One DX um, Mark II here, I have two cards, right? But I have that. But did you see the size of it? I don't know if you saw the size. It's, no. Two fifty six. Yeah. Cut. So during the no. whole wedding, and I shoot raw too, I never have to change this card. And I have two cards. The silly thing is, this uh, 1DX Mark II, they're See, not that's both... That's not healthy, man. I've been using 16 MS, my 32 gig card. You know why? I why? keep switching card. So if your card is busted, yeah. and you only shoot one card a day, and if yeah. it so happens you have two cards, and both yeah. the cards so happen to die or lost it, you lost it. But if I'm shooting 16 gig or 32 gig, yeah. but I have maybe four or five cards a yeah. day, yeah. if I lose one card, I don't lose the whole day. Yeah, but my cards never come out of my camera. They stay in here the whole time. And you saw my rig, right? I'm wearing my camera the whole day like a cowboy. My cat, when I eat Well, dinner, you're just shooting in a good old day back then. It's the same. Right now, people would basically oh, rob you if you're a photographer. Yeah. Because the photography gear is so easy to sell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. Camera gear is crazy. You're gambling, Dave. What? I'm not gambling. I have two cars. They're dual memory. The, they're even dual slots. Even so 32 gig. Come on, man. You're gambling. <laughs> no, but see, I have two cards. They're both 256. One is a CF card. One is a CFast card. And I'm writing dual one. Every time I take one picture, it writes to both cards. And I don't have to take out my memory card throughout the whole day. So that means there's no chance of my memory card getting robbed, dropped, or stolen. Like, well, it's all you need is a couple, two or three unfortunate incidents happen, then boom, bye. <laughs> well, you we, we all take our different risks, right? I think it's gambling, Paul, to have like a bunch of cards and potentially having one in your pocket slip out as you are moving throughout the day. No, that I have is one worse. of those water put and sharp put pelican SD card case yeah. in my, not, I have a fanny bag, kid you not. Ah, uh, you're one of those guys. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to be safe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, everyone takes a risk, but like this, this, this note goes out to like all photographers, wedding photographers that are starting out. It's like make sure you have all the backups to your your gear, and you have a good strategy for your SD or CF cards because. You either you have multiple cards and you don't replace them or you have small cards but you're like replacing them but make sure you have like storage so that you keep them safe, waterproof and you don't lose them throughout your day because that's your most important possession. Yes, your camera is expensive too but if you lose your camera, you have insurance, that's what it's for. Um, but the, the one thing that cannot be replaced is the pictures you take that on that day. So make guard those SD cards CF cards with your life because they're worth that much. Like if I get cornered in the street after a wedding and some guy says, here's a gun to my head, give me your camera. I'm like, yeah, I'll give you my camera. Can I take the SD card out? Because that's what my wedding clients are paying me for. Right? Oh yeah, that happened. I have I have a <laughs> photographer friend that happened and he literally asked for a, get a memory card back. Yeah. Think of it, kind of, yeah, okay, here you go. They just yeah. want money. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, it, it, yeah, there, your card is your life. Your your name is on the line. It's very very important. Got to be but, careful. Nowadays, people are more um, target to people with cameras. Yeah. They just. Yeah, and especially on a wedding day, like you usually when you leave at the end of the day, you, you're vulnerable because you're carrying all your gear with you. At least for me, it's mm -hmm. all on me. And um, it's late. Usually, it's kind of like ten o'clock, and you're going to a parking lot. Sometimes you're at a restaurant and you park like a little bit farther away because you don't have the VIP parking. You just kind of make your way out there. Walk Especially if you're the shooting hall. in San Francisco, like doing wedding mm -hmm. and afternoon session you went out like the pier to pictures, right? Yeah. So in between that time, you're walking from the car to the yeah. location or you're actually shooting, have your camera back open Yeah. and you turn around and that's gone. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. You guys, you guys got to be careful with that too. Like. 
I've had times when I put my camera down to direct the people and so I'm so thankful for my client because because when I'm talking to them, they can see the people behind me. They're like, hey, that guy's going for your camera, that guy's going for your camera. I look back, I grab my camera and that guy just ran the other way because he knew that he was like suspicious. But like if I seriously was talking to him, he would have took my camera and ran. And he knew I couldn't run past him because I have all these other lenses in my bag. I know, yeah, right. Like, I there's no way I can run and get him. So you got to have your eyes on your gear or have it on you all the time. And it's, it's a scary world out there. Wedding photography is, is dangerous. It's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a good paying career. Uh, it's exciting. It's fun. People need to understand more about this. Um, career is that like yeah. why are you people charging so much for one look at how much just look at all the pricing how much the gear costs yeah second uh, the liability is huge because yeah we are technically photographing someone's very special day only happen once in a lifetime so those memory require a lot of like, good equipment to capture yes. and to be safe yes and also we are liability when walking around with all this expensive gear we might get robbed <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then that that's like the uh, that's like the technical stuff. But like, um, experience is a lot that comes into it, right? You oh, yeah. you can give all this gear and you can give the liability to someone that's really responsible, but they need like a couple of years doing it to be able to comfortably manage time, work in stressful condition, figure out lighting on the fly, direct people, coordinate group shots, and get important shots and be able to shoot and get the moment r without a second try, right? All these things come with experience. And that's why wedding photographers charge a lot, but not in the very beginning. In the beginning, they'll, they'll charge much cheaper. But as they build up a reputation and learn those skills, they can charge more. So all those points you said are valid. Plus they have the experience. Definitely the reason you, why they're charged. You need experience. Lot. You have to, yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable shooting a, a paid wedding for uh, five, six thousand dollars without a lot of experience. Otherwise, I wouldn't feel my time is worth it. Anyone else can do it. Yeah, I, I should not tell this on a live stream, but heck, why not? It's a fun story. I kid you not. Uh, one of my first wedding, we did not time this right. <sighs> we were shooting, on, this is a very narrow aisle of the church, and the bride and groom just did their, their vows, they had their first kiss. Two photographers, myself and my wife, we we're both on the side shooting them and getting all the shots. And we're like, shoot, who's gonna cover them walking down the aisle? And when they <laughs> as a, when they're newly wed. So instead of us running down the aisle this way to the back of the room and run back and shoot it, we ran up to the front and try to get behind them and try to go around them. And they were um, they were plus size. Um, couples, so we couldn't fit them. We're like, let us through, let oh, us through. No. Uh, so we didn't get it, and we had to have to reenact it. But yeah, so something like that. It's like I'm so glad that was my first wedding. I think I charged 200 bucks for it. Uh, but yeah, so it was pretty much like on uh, Texas. I said, hey, I I have a camera. I'm getting my experience to become a photographer, a wedding photographer. But this is th I don't have experience. Can you pay me 200 bucks and I can shoot you all the pictures, deliver all the pictures for you. And it's a learning experience for everybody. And they, they, they're down for it because they're on a budget and they're willing to do it. So we made a lot of mistakes. That's why when we were starting out, we charged very little. But as we got experience, we feel more comfortable charging more. But definitely uh, not an easy job. It costs a lot of gear, for the gears, insurance, um, your, your, your life is at risk you're stressful and you have to have a lot of experience. Um, plus there's a lot of marketing and don't forget photo editing takes a lot of time too, right? Like you think mm -hmm. that after you shoot, you, you're done with your job. No, cause you go home and you shoot through, you sit through like easily 20 to 40 hours to edit all the so, photos. Nobody really knows, but for all the wedding vendors, yes, wedding photographers and wedding videographer had the longest hour, not because on that day it's yes. whole, Oh. Post editing, it would quite a lot of time, and yes, I, we constantly have to remind our client that yeah, they don't know about that. No. They don't know why are you work working so hard, why are you charging so much, because yeah. I don't only I don't only work that sixteen hour, <sighs> I work that two week after as yes. well. Yeah, 
Yeah. And then don't forget the time to design the wedding album, follow up with the wedding album. And then even before that, the, the, the consultation, answering all their questions as they decide to book you, uh, if they want to negotiate price or whatnot, uh, all the communication, and then setting up for the engagement session, determining what they want for the engagement session, where they want to go, what they want to wear, and then doing those photos and returning those and getting a pre-wedding album for them. So there's a lot of work into it. So uh, Paul yeah. actually asked a good question about the wedding industry, and I'll let you answer this one, Jeremy. Uh, how do you feel about the wedding industry after the health issue that we have right now? Well, let's put it this way. It doesn't matter which kind of crisis. After, people still get married afterward. Yeah. The only matter is because of the, this crisis, yeah. the social distancing will remain for a while. Yeah. So I, you know, by law. And then people's mindset will still be kind of cautioned about going to huge, large group. Yeah. So I don't see any big wedding can happen anytime soon. Small wedding, but then again, uh, in I think 2018, 2019, US start having this like a kind of called mini weddings, like maximum 20 people. Mm -hmm. So I see that could be a rising of that, and also if we're in city hall, I mean San Francisco, city hall wedding will be you know the civil assembly, that will be the mainstream small weddings. Yeah, small weddings. You you don't see a lot of big weddings. Yeah. I, I would I would totally agree. That's a very good answer, Jeremy. I would say small weddings and uh, potentially, aka pre-wedding shoot where the couples yes, yes, can yes, spend yes, time yes. with you, right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. that's what you're offering right now too in your your packages, mm -hmm. right? So because you think about yeah. it, people would be delaying their postponing their wedding, yes, and don't know when. So when they I don't know, it's probably the stage three when they release <laughs> reopen the city, yeah, hopefully. Yeah, and you can actually go out photographing. Then it's not even so because you know, like one, two, maybe four people. Yeah, photographer, make about us, and the couples, four people going out shooting. Uh, that's no problem. But because of your friends and family waiting for your wedding so long, yeah. and you postpone, you don't know when. At least you get some nice wedding picture you can share with your Absolutely. friends and family. That kind of keep that romantic wedding vibe going on. Yeah. So that should be that could be another thing too. But then um, a lot of people are thinking, oh, let's just do that. Let's you know, just shooting wedding picture is easy, but in, in a way, it's not. It's actually harder than wedding day because there's <laughs> not there's no rule for you to follow. Yes, you have to come up with the pose, where to compose, you know, where to go next, all that stuff. But it's kind of not going to tell you. When you do a wedding day, you go to that venue. Yeah, you, uh, the wedding plan will tell you. Oh, this is what time they walk down the aisle. This is right. what time they do reception. You just follow orders pretty much, <laughs> and then do whatever you can doing that. Right, but doing a a, like a photo shoot like this. It's all on the photographers, like your artistic sense, how to manage your time, how mm -hmm. to manage logistic, yeah, a whole, whole bunch more. It's all yeah. on the photographers. It's, it's, a, it's actually a whole new uh, offering that a lot of photographers can offer now. So they can actually come up with their own uh, system wherever they want. They can say, okay, so we're going to go two hours and the first uh, 30 minutes will be like uh, your wedding outfits in um, these situations and th these reenactments and then the other 30 minutes will be at this location doing so and so and so. So you can kind of figure out like the storyline for them. So I, mm -hmm. I think it's actually a very viable business now. If um, it is, yeah, it, it, it's you better you better change your system. It's like I guess the short answer to this uh, health situation is like every it will change. business is going to be the industry impacted. will change, mm -hmm. and you have to adapt. You, you to need to change. change. Yeah, one of the things that we're changing, Paul, I don't know if you realize, but Jeremy and I are spending a lot of time making videos, building out Pixel Stabbers as our platform because we want to have more of an online presence. We want to teach the future generation of photographers, whether it's wedding mm -hmm. photography, portrait photography, uh, industrial tra uh, travel photography, or landscape photography, whatever it is. We want to help teach the next generation of photography. We also want to unite photographers. We want to talk photography just share our experience, have guests come on our shows and look, share their experience, the tips and tricks about their photography, show them how to post process because Jeremy is great with post processing. He uses Luminar 4, he uses Photoshop, he makes amazing artwork with his photos and all the tips and tricks and just talk about photography. And we plan to actually uh, 
make some money from it so that we can continue to do it. So that's kind of our side um, hustle into uh, this health situation where we can't book as many weddings. In fact, we've been getting mm -hmm. a lot of cancellations. So it, the times are just It's called tough. postpone, not cancellation, postpones. I got some <laughs> cancellation. <laughs> Really? They yes. actually say, no, we don't want winning. Yeah, anymore. I actually had a Brian Groom who were actually in the health field, right? So they work with um, patients all the time, like with the situation, oh, right? So okay, they know how bad it is. And they said they don't know when it's going to get better. And they don't want to have the responsibility to invite their family and friends to potentially be at risk, right? And you don't want your, they don't want their friends and family to have to choose also between uh, attending the wedding or staying at home, right? Because they'll feel bad if they stay at home, but if they go, they're at risk, right? So they said, we're gonna cancel it. We're just gonna get married in City Hall and we're just gonna celebrate, but that's just how they're gonna do it. So I've got some cancellations. It is what it is. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think uh, we're, we're ready to wrap it up. Paul, thank you for huh. asking and commenting oh, on the stream. Way. You really, yeah, you really you, made it fun. Uh, hopefully you can come on and uh, have more questions next time. And also, if you want to, we would love to have you on our channel too. Uh, let us know, drop oh, me yeah. a message. That'd on, be fun, uh, that'd be yeah, fun. Drop me a face, uh, Facebook message, Paul. Back in elementary school, Paul and I, we connected well. His brother and my brother are military together. So they, they, they're, oh, wow. yeah, they're very tight. And then Paul and I, we went to school together. So we know each other. Paul used to watch my back when I was in the nerd stage and I got picked on a lot. Paul took care of me. Yeah, Navy, Navy, my bad. <laughs> my, our brothers were in the Navy. That's right. And this is probably not Navy either, right? <laughs> I'm bad. I'm bad, I'm bad. <laughs> yep, Paul's the muscles. Yeah, you were the brains now. You were also the brains, Paul. Yep. Well, you both have gas. <laughs> and now we both have gas. So, Paul, thanks again. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're healthy. Uh, by the time we meet again, Paul, uh, hopefully we're both in the fittest, the fittest time of our life. Because I don't know about you, but I've been working out a little bit. So, let's get healthy. Let's get fit. Let's get through this whole situation together, Paul. So, thanks again for checking out our streams. <laughs> thanks for the comments and everything. Uh, Jeremy, any last words before we wrap up for the night? Well, I learned a lot about Canon today. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. For sure, yeah, and um, all the, the gear I have is listed below. Let me know if you have any questions. Again, these are older gears that I have. Uh, it's great if you wanna buy old gear to start your photography business too. That's a good alternative because a lot of um, professional photographers are doing really well. They're probably gonna offload a lot of these gears because they're going with a new R series lenses, a new platform mm -hmm. or other. They might switch to like uh, different lines like for example, the Fujifilm lines. So they're gonna unload a lot of these uh, equipment. So if you wanna save money, buy used. Uh, there's nothing wrong with buying lens used. Camera wise, I might not buy a used camera if you don't know what you're looking for because you have to really check it out very carefully. But with a lens, mm -hmm. it's easy to buy used because you check it out, you make sure it's clean, you make sure it focuses well, you're good to go. But yeah, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, check out the new Canon R5 when that's released because that's going to be an amazing camera. Uh, if you can't wait that long, check out the Fujifilm X-T4, which is also a great camera, although it's crop sensor. But this guy uses it. He shoots amazing pictures with it. There's no reason why a crop sensor should stop no you. No doubt. In fact, did you know Fujifilms do not make full frame cameras? They don't. They only make crop sensor and medium format. And medium format. Yes, and their crop sensor is comparable to the full frames that Canon, Nikon, Sony, and Panasonic make, so good stuff. And the nice thing about Fuji's cameras is that because they're crop sensor, their 70 to 200 uh, 2.8 IS equivalent is much lighter. The whole body is lighter, and you're dealing with a mirrorless system, which is great because it's more quiet when you're shooting in like uh, well, it, it gives me more cow eyes. Like you know, when I do wedding, I just go for the crop sensor because to be honest, wedding yeah. picture you don't really need full frame. No. And then when I go for my commercial shoots and fashion shoots, I go for my medium format. Yeah. Boom. Yes. That's it, and uh, so thank you everyone for watching. Uh, check us out next time on uh, YouTube at youtube.com slash pixelstabbers. Our website's coming out soon at pixelstabbers.com. Yep. Um, we'd love to have you there. Like our video, subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we look forward to seeing you guys next time. We're signing out. Thanks again for watching, and we'll Bye. see you next Thanks time. Bye, for watching. Bye. Bye. And that's a wrap. Adios. See you guys, and we're gonna count down. We're going to sign out in three, 
two, one, two, and we are one, done! Two,